out of 20 on the participation, whereas if you didn't do it, you'd get like a 10 out of 20 or, or something like that. I, I forget. Uh, I get confused between this and the 115 class because I've got the points arranged slightly differently and sometimes I remember one for the other. So let me not speculate on it while I'm away from the computer. Let me begin with a word of prayer. So, <clears throat> uh, Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. I thank you for these students. Just ask that you bless our work this morning. Help us to glorify you in what we do and just to understand what we need to about your creation. Again, I pray that the students would be encouraged if they're struggling just to do their best, Lord, each day. And uh, just have the courage to ask questions as they have them, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, let me make sure my thing's working. All right, looks like it is. Let me get started here with uh, a couple of things and then I'll take questions, okay? So, um, just a reminder, laws of logs. Um, so like fundamental is that if we have a not equal to one and a greater than zero and and to context here and I don't always include the context but we want to have x and y be positive all right if that's the case then number one we can say that um, log base a of x y is log base a of x plus log base a of y. And number two, we can say that log base a of x to the power p is equal to, oops, p log base a of x, we can pull the power p out. And three, for division, if we have log base a of x over y, we have log base a of x minus log base a of y, right? So we should keep these properties of logs um, in mind. And of course, beyond all this, even more basic than this, we have the definition of the logarithm, right? The definition of the logarithm, a couple different ways to uh, say it. One way you could say it is this. If y equals a to the x, then log base a of y is equal to x, right? That's one thing you could say. Um, equivalently, we could insist the following two identities hold, namely that log base a of a to the power x is equal to x again, and a to the log base a of y is equal to y again. And this is, of course, for any x in the reals. And this is for y positive. All right. So this is the basic setup. This is what a logarithm is. This is what they do for you. And I haven't proved the laws of logarithms yet, so I'm gonna, I need to start class with that because it is something I owe you the proof of. And so I try, I'll try not to take too long on these proofs, but here's how they go. So log base A of, say, XY. How are we going to do that? So the way I'm going to prove property one here, it's kind of sneaky. What I'm going to do, um, is I'm going to rewrite that as log base a of a to the log base a of x times a to the log base a of y. See, I, I can do that because x and y are positive and that's an identity, right? I can trade x, or I can trade y here, if you like, for log base a a to the log base a of y, right? So just identity. But then the cool thing about doing that is then I can use the what? I can use the property of exponents now. See, that's log base a of a to the log base a of x plus log base a of y, right? So this is by what? This is using what? This is using a to the s times a to the t is a to the s plus t, right? That, that law of exponents. And then, what do I have? Well, look at what I have. I have log base a of a to the something, right? So what comes back out is just the something again, right? So this gives me log base a of x plus log base a of y. And uh, 
hey, that's it, right? That, that's what number one says. So there we go, that's the proof of number one. Really, number one is, is nothing more than, um, you know, it's that law of exponents translated into um, exponential notation. Let's do number two. So, number two, we're going to calculate log base A of x to the power p. I'm pretty much going to do the same thing. So I'm going to trade my x for a to the log base A of x, right? All of that raised to the p power. But what law of exponents do I know here? Remember, we have that a to the s to the p power is equal to a to the sp, which by the way is equal to a to the ps. So I can use that law of exponents to re, uh, recalculate this here. And I have log base a of a to the p um, log base a of x. <clears throat> and um, at this stage, we can again go, oh, well, wait a minute, we've got log of a to something, right? Log of a to something is just the something again. So out pops p log ax, which, of course, is exactly number two, right? So that's the proof of number two. Now, number three, it turns out we get for free. Like number three, see how this goes. So number three, we have log base A of x over y, which is log base A of x times y inverse. All right. So then I can use property one to rewrite that as, you know, log base A to be log base A of um, x plus log base A of y inverse, like that, by 1, right? And then I can use 2 to pull the minus out, right? To pull that minus 1 power out to give me a minus. And uh, that's exactly what we claim in item 3. All right, so like last... Last class, I just claimed these laws of logarithm, um, you know, from, I just kind of pulled them from the sky and used them. But my point to you today is that they're actually straightforward consequences of the laws of exponents that we already know. All right. Um, now, so I've, I've told all my sections, like, there are proofs in here I expect you to know. Really, there's really just one. The proof that I, I cover for you and that I expect you to be able to replicate, essentially, um, is the you know der derivation of the quadratic formula, right? Because I have asked you over and over again, complete the square, complete the square, complete the square, right? Ad nauseum, and um, so there I expect you to understand because that's an important calculational technique. The proof here that I just gave, um, it's not that important, I would say, for most college algebra students to be able to replicate this, right? I would say some of the steps I've made in this proof, they're important to know, um, but really less in the abstract context, more in the context of specific problems. So I, I pretty much never test on this directly. I just, I'm showing it to you for, um, for your information. All right, so do not be scared of this. this is not something I'm going to make you replicate, okay? Um, all right, so anyway, there's that. So um, at this point, now I will transition to examples for today. And any questions about homework, anything people have, feel free to ask. No, no questions? Sure. In the meantime, I'm going to work example one. So example one here, and we'll come back to your question. So example one, I'm going to say f of x equals to say, um, 4 um, plus e to the x minus 2. All right. And what I want to do for us here is I want to ask a number of questions. Like, question A, is f 1 to 1? Right. B, find formula. 
for f inverse of x if possible. C graph y equals f of x and y equals f inverse of x. All right. And so in the process of doing this question, there's about four different homework problems we're going to cover more or less here. Um, so first of all, is f one to one? What do you guys think? Yes. Why? Um, it's like it has such a whole Has the whole. I mean, there, there are two ways we checked one to one in here. What were the two ways? We had algebraic, right? Mm -hmm. And graphical. So which way do you want to do? Graphical. Graphical? All right, sure. Uh, I think they're about the same trouble. So like graphical here is not a bad idea. Because I'm, I'm asked to graph y and f and f, 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 f and f inverse in that last step. So let me just go ahead and give you the graph while we're at it. Yeah, let's do that. So. Um, How's that graph look? Uh, well, essentially, it's got to shift up by four, right? You're going up four. So y equals four behaves like the x-axis for this exponential. And it's, it's shifted over two as well. So it's something like, now, um, this is not a vertical asymptote. It's just, uh, not for this function anyway, but it's, it's kind of a reference point. Um, let me just throw out a couple points here to, to track. Let's track a couple points, right? Like what's f of, f of zero is what? I've got four plus what? E to the minus two, right? So f of zero is, is it's pretty, pretty close to four, right? What's e to the minus two? That's like a ninth, maybe. So it's, it's about right here. What, what is, um, what's f of two? f of 2 is what? 4 plus 1. So f of 2 is 5. Because e to the 0 is 1. So oh, okay. you're, you're fine. Let's see here. What else could we do? How about like, uh, what is f of, um, what's f of 3? We've got 4 plus, plus e to the 1, right? So E is about 2.7, so this is approximately 6.7. <coughs> so let's see here, 2, 3, so 6.7 is kind of like up here somewhere. Anyway, so it, it, the graph looks something kind of sort of like this. All right. I'm going to keep these three points for later. The three points we just found were 0, um, 4 plus e to the minus 2, that's my first point there, the y-intercept. The second point down here was 2, 5. And my third point, if you don't mind me putting some labels like this in here, the third point was uh, 3, 6.7. Those are three points on the graph y equals f of x, yeah? So, okay, now that we've done all this, is this function one-to-one? -one? I think your answer was correct, right? It is one-to-one. -one. It passes the horizontal line test, right? So yes, function is one-to-one. -one. Um, okay, now part B, how do we do part B? Remember, there's a four-step process for finding the formula for f inverse I shared with you guys, right? What was the four-step process? Do you guys remember? Step number one, we write y equals f of x, right? So y equals to 4 plus e to the x minus 2. That was that's step number one of our four-step process. What's our step number two? Do you guys remember? We do what? We solve for 
x. So you guys help me out. How would I solve for x in this formula? What do you think? Square root? Ooh. No. I don't think square root will help us here. Sorry, my four and my y look so much so much alike. That's a four. <laughs> four. There we go. Other ideas? Switch it to natural log. I think that's a good idea, but in order to do that um, effectively, right, the, the, the key operating idea is that natural log of e to the Pac-Man is equal to Pac-Man, right? I mean, so I have to somehow, I have to isolate that in natural. Well, yeah, I mean, there's that, but there's also, I should say, I mean, the point is I have to isolate the exponential, yeah? So I should subtract 4 to the other side first, right? So like y minus 4 equal e to the x minus 2. Then, then I'm on board with your natural log idea, sure. Right now we can take the natural log since we've isolated the exponential. So we've got natural log of y minus 4, natural log of e to the x minus 2, which by the way is x minus 2, right? Hey, now we can solve for x, right? What's x equal to? x is equal to 2 plus the natural log of y minus 4. So if I remember right, at this point I said, you know, in the algorithm, you solve for x, you get x equals to stuff in y, right? Here's my quote unquote stuff in y, you know? And I said, well, once you find that, you say that that's equal to f inverse of y, right? And that was my step three in the, uh, in the algorithm I shared with you guys. But we don't want the formula in terms of y, right? We want the formula in terms of x, so we go on to step four. And step four says what? Step four says f inverse of x equals two. Just flip, you know, trade your y for x, right? So we get plus equals two equals two plus the natural log of x minus four. And there you go, that's the formula for the inverse function. You notice that there's like kind of a really neat interplay between the formulas, right? My 4 become a 2, my 2 became a 4, and the exponential became a natural log. There's kind of a pattern here. Um, there's not always such a neat and clean pattern between the function and its inverse, but you can kind of see it here. How do you graph that? What are the, what are the features of this graph? So basically this is what? We take y equals the natural log of x, right? You shift it 4 to the right, that gets you y equals natural log of x minus 4. And then you shift it up 2 to get you what we're, at, we're looking for here. So in terms of the graph over here, that is going to have a vertical asymptote of, 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 um, of x equals to 4, right? So here we have a vertical asymptote, like here for the inverse function, right? This is x equals to 4. Yeah? Yeah? How did the natural log of y minus 4 turn into a 2? Yeah, you said the 4 turned into a 2, and then the... Oh, no, no. This, 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 this right here right. Is, a, is just that term right there. And so what happened here was we added 2 to both sides. So like this x is here, whereas I've added two to the other side. Basically, I add two to the other side and then flip the, flip the sides to get that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, yep. So um, let's see here. So if the function has a horizontal asymptote of like y equals 4, the inverse function is going to have a vertical asymptote of x equals to 4. You see that going on here in the formula. See, because natural log blows up to minus infinity when you, get, when you plug, plug 0 into it, right? If you, well, you can't plug 0 into it. It's undefined, right? Natural log is only defined for positive inputs. So 
basically the domain of f inverse is x greater than 4. And um, well, anyway, we can get a pretty accurate graph of that function if we just take the points we already have for our function, right? And we flip them. Remember, that's how we can graph the inverse one way, is just to take pairs of uh, points on your graph for the function and flip them over. That gives you points for graph, points on the, uh, the inverse's graph, right? So I'll do the inverse in purple. But um, like this point, 0, um, comma, um, a little bit bigger than 4, it maps to 4, a little, uh, a little bit bigger than 4, comma, 0. So this is like the dual to that point, right? Here I go to, I've got 2, 5, I map over here to 5, 2, which would be about here, 5, 2, right? And then I've got 3, comma, 6.7, that I trade for 6.7, comma, 3, which is about here. All right? So I've got um, 4 plus e to the minus 2, comma, 0. Then I've got my point 5, comma, 2. Then up here is my 6.7, comma, 3. There's my three points. And I know that the shape is like a vertical asymptote because logarithms, they, they go to minus infinity as you approach the edge of their domain. And then they just kind of grow up and up and up like that. So, you know, that's, that's my best attempt here at the picture. If I did it perfectly, right, the red graph and the purple graph, they should be reflections of one another. Basically, it should be the same shape, but flipped over the line y equals x, right? So y equals x, the place where we're supposed to be reflecting over, comes right down the middle here like that. Yeah, this is y equals x. If I did my graph right, the red graph and the purple graph should be reflections of one another across the line y equals x. And right. Anything else we could say about this? We could talk about the domain and range. That might be interesting. What's the domain of f? You have a bunch of homework questions about domain and range, right? Like, what's the, what's the domain of f here? Negative infinity to positive infinity, right? And what's the range of the f inverse? That's, it's the same, right? That's the range of f inverse, isn't it? See that the range goes all the way down and all the way up. Keeps going and going. Um, what's the range of the function? So it, it, it never gets to 4, right? It's always bigger than 4 and just keeps going up and up. So we got like 4 not included to, uh, to, where, to infinity, right? And notice that that's actually also the domain of the inverse function. So we should always see this uh, juxta, like this mirroring of domain and range for the function and the inverse function, right? Just like that. Question? Yeah. Are we talking week 11 or week 12? 11? Okie doke. Number 8? Number 18. Oh, 18. Do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, yeah, this one, <clears throat> this one's tricky. You're um, not wrong to be stuck on this one for sure. Um, number 18 is tricky. So here's my hint for number 18. If we, st so in number 18, you're told it's either 2 to the x or 3 to the x, right? Shifted around. So if you look at the graph that you're given, the question is like, is it 2 to the x or is it 3? Do you have a sense of which one it is? Not sure. So one of the things I noticed, I was thinking about this, is if we look at the graph of 2 to the x versus the graph of, um, so we say this is the y equals 3 to the x, right? And then here's like y equals 2 to the x. So if you, if you look at it, you can study um, the points on it. So this one has intercept of um, 0, 1, right? Well, they both have y-intercepts of 0, 1, right? What's the next point? If you go 1 over, it's where? It's 1, 3, right? This one is... Um, you know, 1, 2. If you go one more over, 
you've got 2, 9, right? This one, you've got, you know, 2, 4. And you keep going over, right? The thing is, if you look at 3 to the n plus 1 minus 3 to the n, that's 3 to the n times 3 minus 3 to the n, which, by the way, is 3 to the n times 3 minus 1, which is 2 times 3 to the n. So like the, the jumps in the graph of the 3 to the x function, they go in multiples of like multiples of 3, like 2 times 3 to a power. So like the first jump, the first jump in the 3 to the x function is um, the first jumps in the 3 to the x function is just 2. See that? If we look at that, that's, that's 2, right? Then this one, we're going from 9 to 3, 3 to 9, right? That's 6. So that's 2 times 3, right? If you go to the next one up there, it's actually 2 times 9 because the next one's at 27, and 27 minus 9 is 18. So this is like the, uh, the stepping of the 3 to the x function, right? But in contrast, if you do 2 to the n plus 1 minus 2 to the n, something kind of funny happens. So you get 2 times 2 to the n minus 2 to the n, which if you do the algebra here, is just 2 to the n. So the funny thing is, if you look at steps um, like subsequent integer values of the 2 to the function, it always jumps up by a power of 2. Like, so here, the first step is just 1. The second step is 2. What's the next thing over here? It's, what, well, it's 3 comma 8, right? Which is 4 up. The next point would be 4 comma 16, which, by the way, is 8 up, and this continues, all right? So the, the way that the 2 to the x function and the way that the 3 to the x function grow, they're really different. So if you look at the problem, right, look at what you're given, and look at the points and see how they're, see how they're increasing. What do you think is the story there? I've got, in mine, I've got, I, I assume yours might be different, you know? I, don't, I, I'm not, I think these are randomized a bit. Is that the same as mine? Two. No, they randomize them. But we can... Here, well, here, I'll help you with yours. Tell me the points on yours and we'll, we'll talk about it, yeah? Zero, zero negative seven? And then what? Okay. Okay, so let me try that out. So we've got zero, negative seven. And then one, negative six. And then two, negative four. Um, let's see here. So we're going up one, and then we're going up two, aren't we? So if I could do this better. And, and, it's, and where does it kind of level off to? It's got a, it's got a place where it kind of plateaus to. Where is, it, where, is it, where is it asymptotically going to? Yeah, like the horizontal. I bet, it, I bet it's uh, minus 8, maybe. So like minus 8 is where it's tending to. So here's a, here's a picture of the graph that she's given as best as I can re re replicate it here. Right? It, it's something kind of sort of like this, right? Okay. The, the, the question in number 18 in the homework is, hey, what, what's the formula for this, right? Isn't that the question? Like, what's the formula? So, and now they're kind. They tell you either y equals 2 to the x or y equals 3 to the x, right? So what do you guys think? Is this, is, I mean, and, and it's not just that, right? It's like y equals um, a constant um, plus 2 to the x, or y equals a constant, and, and it could be shifted, right? So it could be, um, 
you don't know exactly what the shift is. It could be shifted horizontally or vertically, I think it said. And it might have even allowed for reflections, but in fact, they didn't reflect it in the homework problem. So what do you guys think? Is it, is it, is it 2 to the x? Is it 3 to the x? What, what do you think? What's the story here? You're, you're going what? From minus 7 to minus 6, right? And then that's yeah, up 1. And then we're going from minus 6 to minus 4, which is up 2, right? It has, it has got to be 2 to the x. Then the question is, which 2 to the x is it, right? So it's something like, can I erase my, my hint? All right, so I guess I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Not without some uh, some assistance. Let's see here. So <clears throat> now now we're getting closer, right? We we have a sense of we still don't know what the the C or the A is, right? Um, I mean, you could guess, right? But so we, we think it's something like c plus two to the x minus a, right? And once you've got this, then you can use the points that you're given to to narrow down what the c and the a are, right? Like for example, zero zero seven, zero minus seven, super nice, right? Because so this is this is f of x, right? But I know that f of zero equals to minus seven, right? Actually, from the I can I can do better. What is let, let's let me cut through the noise here. Cut through the static. What does C have to be? If the if the green dotted line is where it asymptotically goes to, what is the meaning of C? What what happens to the exponential function? Before I do this, let me do the easy part. So from this green dotted line here. From the horizontal asymptote, I see c is equal to minus 8. And the reason I see that is that, you know, um, as x becomes very, very, um, you know, a very, very large negative number, that 2 to the x minus a drops to 0, right? So the formula just tends to c for really large negative values, right? So like. Whatever, and, and we, we saw this over here too, right? Like the horizontal asymptote, right? That's this plus four. If I've got a horizontal asymptote at four, that means I've got an addition of four in the exponential formula. So over here, I've got a horizontal asymptote of minus eight. That means I've got an addition of minus eight in the formula. So, uh, you know, I'm looking at y equals f of x, which is apparently minus eight plus two to the, some, some shift in x, yeah? So what is a? Well, let's let's plug in zero, right? F of zero is what? It's minus seven. That's given. That's minus eight plus two to the what? Zero minus a, right? So this gives us what? This gives us if I add eight to both sides, I've get one, I've got one equals two to the minus a. So some of you might have solved this problem without doing what I'm doing. You might have just seen the answer directly, right? Which is what? What's, what how do you solve that? What, a equals what? How can I get 1 equals 2 to the minus a? What, what, what's the only choice of a that makes sense there? 2 to what power is 1? No, no. Let me ask a different question. Where does the 2 to the x function cross the y, I mean, cross the, where, where do you have a value of 1 in this y equals 2 to the x graph? Remember? Just right here, right? The only way I can have 
an output of 1 is to have an input of 0. It has to be that minus a is equal to 0, which is to say that, like you said, a is equal to 0. So the answer then is y equals to, you know, minus 8 plus 2 to the x for your problem. Yeah, yeah. If minus zero, we just the minus just goes away. Yep. So that one's a little bit tricky. Now I, I think you could have come to this answer through experimentation, basically, maybe faster than I did, you know, just by tinkering. But that's how I think about it systematically. And these boards are so loose, like they just flex on the wall. <laughs> oh, come on. Any other questions? Number 39 and 11. Let's see here. Sure. What about it? Just how to do it? Ah. Not sure what to do with. The, oh, log one half. 39? Is it log base a half? Or you're saying log of log base 2? No, it's one half. It says you add it to the, um, the one half added to the two. Two. Oh, I got here. Like, I got here, and I didn't know where to go from there. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I got gotcha. you. So just you're, you're you're on the right path. Um, sorry, I, I was I'm making sure we weren't talking. There's another problem that's got like log base a half in it, which is weird. Um, so, but we're not we're talking about this one. So for me, it's seven r to the fifth over z cubed, which I think is going to be like logically equivalent to your problem if it's not exactly the same. Yeah. So yeah, the first thing is, the whole expression is to the power one half, right? So like that square root means what? That means an exponential notation, 7r to the power 5 over z cubed to the 1 half. So like you said, we can pull the half out, right? That's by property what? Property 2, right? Property 2 of the logarithm, thinking of the whole thing as x. And then, <coughs> Basically, leave the half out front, and you just apply property, the other property to the log. So um, I'll do it in two steps, okay? So like 1 half. So we've got log base 2 of 7 r to the power 5 minus log base 2 of z cubed. So what did I just use here? I used property 3 of the, lo the th number 3 of the log laws that I talked about to start with, right? We have log of a quotient, we do log of the numerator minus log of the denominator. See that? And, and then, well, here I've got a product, right? I've got a product of things, so I can use number, log law number one. Log law, it sounds like, it's hard to say. Let's see here. Log base two of seven plus log base two of r to the power five. All right. 
And I guess while I'm at it, we can pull that 3 down, right? Because this is minus 3 log base 2 of z, right? That's by property 2 of the logarithm. We can pull powers down, right? Yeah, my next, the, the next thing to do would be to see this 5 here, right? We can take this 5 and essentially property 2 says we can pull it out to here. That's what property 2 over there says. And so that gives us, I'll write one more step here before I write the final answer. Log base 2 of 7 plus 5 log base 2 of R minus 3 log base 2 of z. And then I just multiply the half through. Um, so that gives you like one half log base 2 of 7 plus 5 halves log base 2 of r minus 3 halves log base 2 of z. I think the answer in the, I mean, you know guys, like do you factor the half out or do you multiply it through? I think that's really a question of style. The answer key has the half multiplied through. Like, I don't think this is like written in stone or anything. You know? If I said to simplify this by expanding the logarithm into a, you know, a sum of um, more simple logarithms or something like that, I would be very, I'd be perfectly content with this as my answer as opposed to the final one, you know? Yeah, that's the answer there. Yep, yep. It is, indeed. Okay, so I'm going to transition over here to uh, week 12 homework now. So number, we're work number 13 in week 12. So this will be our example four for today. And here we're facing 2 to the x minus 1 equal to 3 to the 2x. Can we solve this? How would we solve this? So um, pretty much, so like last class, I solved some ones where you know, uh, fate smiled upon us. We had the same base on both sides. So we could use the one-to-one -one property of the exponential to solve. When you have something like this, you have 2 to the power something equals 3 to the power something. Pretty much the only way you have to attack these kind of problems is to either, you know, take the log base 2 or the log base 3 of it. But then you're still going to have something sort of unnatural. I think the easiest, for me, the easiest way to handle these ones is use natural log. I just take the natural log of both sides to solve something like this just to be equally um, uncharitable to both the base 2 and the base 3, I just use natural log. Really, you could use any base log that you wanted. It's going to solve the problem, but it's going to make the answer look different. I'll use natural log. And then power property, we pull out x minus 1 times natural log of 2 equals to 2x log 3. And once you get to this point, it's pretty much the same game we play at the start of this course, which is to isolate x, right? Don't be mystified. Natural log of 2, natural log of 3, these are just numbers that you can calculate with your calculator. Don't do it. Leave them symbolic, <laughs> right? Um, like putting in numbers for natural log 2 and natural log 3 here is like really bad move. So just leave them symbolic. It's fine. Um, and what I've got is I've got x log 2 minus 2x log 3 equals to log 2. So I moved all my x's to the same side. Now I factor x out. I've got x log 2 minus 2 log 3 equals to log 2. And then finally solve for x. And there would be the answer. Could we simplify the answer as like a ratio of logs? We could do that, right? 
like another way to write the answer would be natural log of 2 divided by the natural log of 2 ninths. What did I do? What did I do there? Let's talk about that for a second. So natural log of 2 minus 2 log 3 is equal to natural log of 2 minus the natural log of 3 squared by property 2 of the logarithm, right? 3 squared is 9. I have log of 2 minus log of 9 by property 3 of the logarithms that I proved at the start of today. That is equal to natural log of 2 ninths. So there you go. And um, yet another way we could think about it is to find the decimal approximation, right? I may have some problems on like the next quiz or test where I ask you to find an exact form of the answer and also find the decimal approximation to the answer. And so like here's the decimal approximation would be, you know, like log 2 divided by log of 2 ninths. That gets me... I'll give you the first four digits of that, approximately minus 0 0.4608, right? So you do, you do need a calculator for the next exam for sure that you can do that kind of thing in, all right? So there's that problem. Let's work another one. Uh-oh. Oh, rats. <laughs> I'm the worst cameraman. Well, there's what's left of it, folks. Sorry about that. <sighs> as, as I was erasing it, I knew I had that sense. Ah, no, what have I done? Oh, well. So this is example five, I think. Yeah. So here we go. e to the x squared, e to the x squared equals to 148. So I'm slowly working my way up to um, sort of more difficult problems in chapter 12. I, I think that's kind of the base level problem. You, you had problems like example four in week 11 homework, right? give or take. This one is a little bit different. How do we solve this? Actually, it's kind of the same thing again. We just take the natural log of both sides. So if we take the natural log of e to the x squared, we get the natural log of 148. But natural log of e to the x squared is x squared. And then that gives us x equals 2 plus or minus the square root of natural log of 148. And that um, is like number 14 in week 12 homework, all right? I'll show you another one here. Here we have, oh yeah, I should have done this one in the other section, I realize now. This is different. I didn't see the three at the start of this problem, that three. The plus one, plus one, not a big deal. All right, like the plus one, fine. You can subtract one to the other side, big deal. You know, big deal. But the, that three there, that changes the nature of the problem a little bit. I'm not saying anything too big. Like, subtract 1 to the other side. What do you got? Fourteen, right? How are you going to solve this? There are different ways to go about it. Um, 
if you want me to be boring, we could just solve it the same way we solved the last two, which is just to hit the equation with the natural log. It's important that before you take the natural log of the equation, you have eliminated any sums. Like if you take natural log when you still have a sum, you, there's nothing you can do to that. Like if I just tried to take the natural log of the original equation, I could do it. It's not wrong. It's just not right. In the sense like, okay, great. I took the natural log, now what? Now nothing, I can't do anything to that. There are no properties of the logarithm that apply to that. If I take the natural log to, the, to my second equation though, all I've done is subtract one to the other side, but that makes all the difference in the world because now I can take the natural log of three times 1.21 to the x, and I get that that's the natural log of 14. But by the properties of logs, this is log three plus, you know, x times the natural log of 1.21 equals to log 14 which then gives me x log 1.21 equals to log 14 minus log 3, which gives me the solution because I can um, subtract, I mean I can divide by log of 1.21 like that. So there you go. That's the answer and I think it, the textbook answer, uh, the one that this is, this is like problem uh, 15, I think they asked for the uh, nearest, to find it to the nearest thousandth. So for mine, I'm supposed to like, you know, find the decimal approximation to that. Um, so I do log 14 minus log 3. Um, and then I take that and I divide it by the log of 1.21. And that for me gets approximately 8.081 that's it I think to the thousandth that's that's it because the third decimal place is the thousandth place all right okay so what's the other way you could have solved this as a student, I probably wouldn't have done what I just did. As a student, what I would have done in your place, probably I would have divided both sides by three before I took the log. But it's kind of, I mean, either way, if you, if you divide both sides by three up here, what happens in the next step is you get log of 14 thirds, right? But what is log of 14 thirds? Log of 14 thirds is log of 14 minus log of three. So it, it all, it doesn't make a difference in terms of like the answer, but Let's go on. Example seven. This one is different. This one's genuinely different. This is number 16. So here we face e to the 2x minus 14 e to the x plus 45 equal to zero. Actually, I'm going to change my problem from this to something a little bit different. I'll give me a second here. Let me think about this. Ah, thinking. I'll put a plus four over here and a rather a minus four here and a plus three there. There we go. That should do it. How do you solve this? This is kind of sort of like number 16, but I, I changed it. Number 16's a little bit different. At least mine is. I'm not sure that they're all the same way, but how do you, so here what we do is we go, oh, well, e to the x, e to the 2x is really e to the x squared, right? Three times e to the x minus four. So we have to have kind of a, a moment of inspiration and go, Wait a minute, that's really just y squared plus 3y minus 4 equal to 0, where I've done what? I've set y equal to e to the x. So I make a, make a substitution, and with that substitution, it becomes a quadratic equation. But the good news is we already know how to solve quadratic equations, right, all day long. Not a problem. We can do this. So can you do it? 
Can you, I think this one, I mean, in principle, it could be completing the square or something ugly, but this one's easier. You guys can factor this one, right? How do I get a minus four? I do, I guess I could try minus four plus one, that would do it, right? What do you guys think about that? <coughs> Bless you. Say plus four minus one. Right, this one not quite right because if I multiply that out, I get minus three, right? But I, I want to get plus three, so I really should have y plus four, right? I think through it, y minus one. So, but the usual trial and error will find you the factoring here. And what's that tell me? That tells me what? Y is equal to minus four or y is equal to one. Now is that the answer? That's not the answer. We're looking for x, right? So this reduces to what? This reduces to e to the x equals to minus 4 or e to the x equals to 1. Now if you want, you can try taking the natural log of both sides, right? So x equals to the natural log of minus 4, x equals to the natural log of 1. This does not exist. You can try it out, your calculator, try calculating log of minus 4. Mine will tell me error, math, error, cancel, go to, whatever. It, it doesn't like it, you know. Natural log of 1, on the other hand, we should actually know without picking up a calculator, that's 0. That's just what I was talking about in the other problem with picking out minus c. So natural log of 1 is 0. So the answer here is x equals to zero. There's just one solution. This over here, so basically this piece was extraneous. That was an extraneous solution because we can't have minus four equal to e to the x, right? That's just not possible. E to the x is what? It's strictly positive. Now the one in the homework, the one I had written up there initially, it had a 45 and a 14 in the middle. The one in the homework, I actually had two positive roots to the quadratic equation. And if there's two positive roots, you get two corresponding values of x. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way, you know? Let's look at another. So number 17. So up to this point, we have pretty much predominantly focused on problems that come to us more or less in an exponential format, right? So we're now we're transitioning to looking at some problems which are really equations that are stated in a logarithmic format. And so the, the way we solve these is kind of upside down from what we've been doing. Um, but these are good problems. They'll give us additional understanding of how logarithms work and everything, among other things. So, so here's, here it is. 2 natural log of x equals to 10. How do we solve this? And then to save myself some walking, the next example will be log base 3 of 2x minus 6 equals to 2. So how do you guys, what should we do here? I, I think the first thing to do, um, what I'd do would be to, to isolate the log, right? So that's simple enough to do. I divide both sides by 2, right? I get log x equals to 5, yeah? And how do you, how do you get rid of the log? What do you do? We've been taking the natural log of the equation to get rid of exponents, right? because the log is the inverse 